Can you count? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right. Bye bye. It's the first track on a new compilation of Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers out on uh, Re Revola. It's a new reissue label launched by Creation Records, a, a fine collection. We'll hear more from that over the coming weeks. Well, uh, tonight I'll be speaking to rock photographer Ian Dixon, whose work is currently on show in London, and uh, the king of the Funketeers, creator of Parliament and Funkadelic, Mr George Colourful Hairstyle Clinton. But coming up in this hour, my guest will be the sci-fi expert Professor Tom Shippey, who's the editor of the new Oxford book of science fiction stories. It's the current Isn't single it? from R.E.M. and it's called Man on the Moon. This is Peter Kern with you till one on GLR and I'm joined now by uh, my next guest who's the photographer Ian Dixon and uh, Andrew Davies who's uh, his patron I guess who's uh, currently running an exhibition of uh, Ian's work at the Gallery on the Lane in uh, Chiswick in West London. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, Ian now how did you get into photography first of all? We'll talk about some of the uh, fairly stunning examples of rock stars you've caught in uh, uh, what, what would we say, relaxed and energetic poses both uh, how, how did you kick off? We're in rock photography? Yeah um, I was working in a theatre in Newcastle and um, I met a man called Bob Brown who managed the City Hall a venue where most bands kicked off the tours and he invited me to come and take pictures whenever I wanted to and I got hooked into it in that manner, you know. Now, uh, the exhibition uh, features uh, a, a whole host of stars from uh, Bob Marley through Brian Ferry, The Who, um, and Alex Harvey. And uh, this being radio, obviously, <laughs> well, our descriptive powers are are uh, are called up. But um, first of all, um, there's there's a you brought along a, a, an LP cover for the world of David Bowie. Yeah. Now, how did you come to do that? one? it's it's a fairly sort well, of classic seventies pose. That was courtesy of Bob Brown again in the City Hall. Um, Bowie's manager had put a, a block on photographers taking pictures of his eye and um, Bob gave me a, a steward's armband and a torch, told me to hide my camera, direct people to the seats in between shots. <laughs> That's how I got them. <laughs> what, so, so did you just uh, open the coat and whip the camera out at the odd moment? Literally. <laughs> Now, uh, Brian Ferry is, is uh, also featured. He's a notoriously shy uh, man. I mean, was he uh, happy about having his snap taken? Oh, well, I was Roxy's tour photographer for two years. In fact, I came down to London with him. Right, so th what, what must that have been like? Because they were certainly one of those bands that, uh, well, Ferry certainly was addicted to style, if you like. That's w right. W were they fairly particular about the moments when they'd allow you to photograph no. them? No. Complete freedom. There's in those days, it was complete freedom. Um, you mean now, nowadays that people are much more self-conscious of what will eventually oh, very, reach the public? Very. They don't like um, they don't like sweat anymore <laughs> in rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> they like it all clean and uh, sanitised, I think. And the, even some of the, uh, like especially the heavy metal bands that get photographed, they almost look as if you know someone has the stylist has sprayed right. on the sweat. The hairdresser on <laughs> the side stage, yeah, that's right. Now uh, there's an extraordinary photograph of uh, Alex Harvey. I, I think uh, most people have sort of seen him in a, a very sort of dynamic mode, uh, strutting the stage. But this is quite sad in a way. It's a real sort of uh, close-up uh, frontal face. I mean. Uh, was he sort of up for that, or did he? Would he have preferred to have his more uh, sort of colourful stage image projected? Um, I think Alex was a sad person in lots of ways. Um, he paid a lot of dues to the business. He lost a brother who was killed on stage. In fact, I met Alex because of Les's death. Um, I became firm friends with him in 1973, and uh, I did this session with him for his gig at the Lyceum for the Halloween gig and that was just a one-off. I think he quite liked the, the flamboyance so this is one of his off moments I think yeah. but, but it is a nice photograph. It is indeed. One of my favourites. There, there's a superb one also of uh, Bob Marley in action, oh, Lo right, yeah. locks flowing, where was that taken? That was Birmingham, Birmingham Odeon um, and that was a pure fluke that shot. It was the first shot of a, a brand new film, just as he was leaving the stage. I just quickly loaded the camera, pointed out and took it. It was just pure accident. And uh, the lighting was particularly fortunate as well, because he's, uh, he's almost yeah. in silhouette, isn't he? That's right, I didn't have time to meter it. 
I just kissed it and took it, you know. Shot, shot mm. from the hip. Now, th there's a, a rather unusual photograph of um, Johnny Weismuller, it, it looks like, with, his, with Alan right. Freeman, with yep. his arm around him. Where was that taken? Uh, it was taken in the, the foyer of the Paris Sheraton Hotel. Um, Freeman has spotted the, the former Tarzan, walked over and introduced himself, and before he, anybody knew it, he was asking him to do his famous war cry. Uh, and there was this loud yell in the middle of this hotel. Just it brought everyone to the, the standstill. So that was obviously in that situation. I mean, do, do you always try and blend into the background uh, with people? I mean, is that the way you work, or are you quite upfront? Well, I have to be upfront sometimes, but I prefer to be the visible man. I like them not to see me because uh, they tend to get self-conscious with a camera pointing at them. Mm. Although uh, they do get used to it after a while. I, I'd say some of them do. Some of them even like it, perhaps. Yes, yes indeed, yes. Now, um, Andrew Davis, you're actually, uh, you run the gallery on, on the lane. How did you uh, come across Ian's uh, photographs? Were you a fan of many years standing? I've always liked photographic work, and uh, basically I met Ian through his girlfriend, called Grace, and we got together and started chatting about all the different things that he'd done over the last 20 years. And we just basically came up with the idea, fairly rapidly, that it would be quite nice to actually show other people these shots because they're such amazing sort of it's a capture of a time that's gone in a lot of cases it, it's a funny I mean we know that music itself is very very evocative of, of a time and a place and uh, I mean photographs can sometimes let, let that get out of the way but certainly from um, a lot of your photographs and there's uh, you know you get the feeling that the music's um, going along with the actual photograph is it important for you to, to get sort of the elements of uh, a person's life into the photograph, oh, uh, the musical life, as opposed to just you know a straight photograph, documentary evidence of them. It's very important. Um, I mean, how, how can you set about? Can you plan such a thing to, to do such a thing, or is it just being in the right place at the right time? It's being in the right place at the right time. It's also when built, you, you try to capture that essence because it's the moment you take it. Once you've taken it, it's gone. Just like once you've heard music, it's gone too. But it remains in in the mind, or in the mind's eye, in this instance. Now uh, we've been talking about rock stars, and uh, we've got this ones classic ones of uh, Jimmy Page strutting off the stage with the hair all over the place. But uh, somebody from a different era, Bing Crosby, you've captured looking uh, <laughs> rather wistful, or looking sideways, or shifty. Maybe it is. Where was that taken? Uh, that was at Chapel Studios in Bond Street. It was during one of his last sessions. Uh, I was working for his record company and um, went down there and uh, he was very dictatorial, very imperial. He wouldn't let me take pictures from certain angles or one profile or another. I had to do them from face to face and he wouldn't let me do anything else. He just tolerated me <laughs> no more. As, as he did uh, his children, I think, <laughs> if, so if, if, if the stories are, are true. Now, um, is there a time when uh, you wouldn't actually uh, take a photograph of somebody, you know, in a situation, mm. if, you, if you saw, right, you know, it's a, it's a perfect, it's an unusual scene? Well, there are, there are limits, obviously. Uh, these people have the moments of privacy, you don't interrupt that. Or in cases of emergency, you don't interrupt that either. Well, uh, well, one well, example, well, sorry, sorry, go on. Uh, that's what I was just <laughs> what was going to ask you. Was I a white city when David Cassidy was playing? Um, well, that girl was killed. Uh, all the photographers stopped taking pictures and started helping people out of the out of the crowd. So we have our we have our morals. Well, yeah, I think things have changed certainly in terms of television coverage. When uh, we witness some disasters, the the, mm. the last thing that a lot of people want is to stop taking photographs and, and helping. It's uh, roll the cameras. It's entertainment for That's the right. six, six o'clock news. Um, the Stranglers are also featured looking suitably mean and moody. Where, did they live up to the reputation when you pointed a camera at them? Uh, not really. It was all... It's just publicity. You know, they put on a, a public front so the fans can live out that, that image. But in private, they're just like you and me. Right. I've been living out the Stranglers' image for years. What if I knocked it on the head a while back, you know, when nobody took me seriously. 
Um, it's a fantastic exhibition, uh, Ian, and uh, I believe you. that your work is actually going to be uh, running fairly permanently. Andrew, is that right at the gallery? Yes. I mean, I not, mean, not in the same scale at the moment, but uh, it will always be there. Yes, I think we've decided. I mean, the amount of interest that we've had from both other photographers that have come along to see the exhibition uh, and just generally people walking past and saying, oh, yes, I must have a look. Uh, we've decided basically to take Ian on as a regular exhibitor within the gallery, along with all the other artists who we exhibit. And uh, I mean, with the gallery, I mean, photography is one medium that we exhibit, but I think quite an important one because, <coughs> excuse me, that unfortunately today, photography isn't taken that seriously as an art form. In the States, it is, it's very strong. Um, and I think it's sort of something that people to can appreciate and will appreciate if they're given a chance to see it mm. and realise the quality that photographers like Ian can produce for uh, them. As an alternative to, um, you know, very stylishly constructed but uh, possibly pretentious uh, shots, you actually tend to catch people on the hoof, Ian? Mm. Well, these are press shots mainly, taken for reproduction in, in magazines. They're not um, carefully staged shots, it's real life. OK, well, if you can catch a slice of uh, 20 years of uh, Ian Dixon's real life in, in the rock world, a photography exhibition running at the gallery on the lane, uh, which is on Acton Lane in Chiswick. Uh, the telephone number, if you want to ring and go along, I believe you've uh, fairly fluid opening hours. Uh, so if you, if you can't get there during working hours, um, well, not too late, but you can give uh, Andrew a ring. And the number is 081 742 And Ian Dixon's photographies on show there. The exhibition runs until Saturday, the December the 5th, 1992. And uh, thanks both of you, Ian and Andrew, for coming in. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.